Good evening to most of you. Uh, good morning to a few of you. Happy lunchtime to a couple of others, I guess, in the States. And it's very exciting to think that we're actually going out across the world. So welcome to all of you uh, who've joined us this evening. Welcome to those of you who are used to uh, this and are coming back and listening to us again. And a special welcome to those of you uh, for whom it's the first time. My name's Matthew Sheehan, and I'm going to be your host this evening. I'm the one, by the way, by the door. I think they put me by the door just in case it all goes pear shaped and I can <laughs> leg it. Um, this is the fourth webinar that we've run, and this time we're going to be looking at um, what clubs can do to engage new members. Obviously, a hot topic um, around the world with sailing clubs. And now the overall theme is actually the future of dinghy sailing. But this evening, the specialist sort of area that we're going to be looking at is about effective marketing and communications in order to attract new members and obviously to try and uh, boost participation and or uh, membership. So that's what we're going to try and do this evening. First of all, uh, we're going to have a little quick sound check. This always makes me laugh because uh, we'd like you to confirm that you can hear us by saying so in the question box on your screen. Presumably those of you that can't are just very good lip readers, but we'll have a little look and see uh, if yeah. you can see us. Yeah. Hear us even. You can see us. Yeah. yeah. Good. good. Lovely. Excellent. Thank you for that. Right. That's the first bit done. So first, some introductions. Our panel of experts, the hardcore that have been driving this machine for months now, uh, include uh, Alistair Dixon here. Alistair, give us a wave. It's Alistair. Alistair's the RYA Director of Sport and Development. Liz Russell from Russell Marketing. So Liz there in the red. Uh, Liz is a marketing and marine marketing and uh, consultancy expert. And Mark Jardine from yachtsandyachting.com and sailworld.com, who I'm sure many of you know. Mark, I want to start off with you. I mean, you own a dinghy and um, sailing magazine, an online, I should say, dinghy and sailing magazine. To what extent do you see that marketing communications as being a big factor in the success of UK clubs going forward or any club? Well, there is a direct correlation between the marketing that clubs do and that can be from the point of view of what they do in the local press and what they do in online sailing magazines and how they report on their events and then the attendance in those events, be they racing, social or just people getting out and participating on the water. Um, I've got examples such as Liam Loughton Sailing Club, Livington Town Sailing Club, Chichester Yacht Club, and of course the Selden Sail Juice Wind Series, which you compete in yourself, where good reporting and good marketing of those events results in higher attendance. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to that uh, a fair bit later on. So we're also pleased to welcome our three uh, Sailing Club representatives. Um, who will talk about their clubs and their clubs' initiatives. Um, so I'll just quickly run through who they are so you know who they are. We've got uh, Kate Brown from Dartmouth Yacht Club. Kate, uh, hopefully you're still there. Give us a little uh, uh, say hello and tell us what you do at Dartmouth Yacht Club. Hi, uh, yes, I am still here and uh, welcome to uh, a wet and windy South Devon. Uh, yeah, I am Commodore there. I have just finishing two years. I'm just about to finish. Um, but um, yeah, we've been uh, pretty busy down here and um, it's nice to join in with everybody um, to talk about this subject. Great. Thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing from you in just a tick. Before we do, uh, James, he's actually here in real life in the room. There's James. Hello. James. You're from St Denis Boat Club, just down the road, around the corner from where we are. I am. So St Denis Boat Club is here on the Solent, and uh, we are probably the smallest boat club on the Solent, but uh, we don't let size get in our way. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Pleased to hear it. And our third uh, expert is Bev Hatley, who is uh, from South Staff Sailing Club. Bev, if you're there, tell us uh, what you get up to there. Hi, we're at Club from the Midlands, um, and I'm a senior instructor and look after the junior training. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So those are our three experts from the club. Now, we're also joined with us uh, by a special guest this evening, Simon Badman. Uh, Simon's from Social B, which is a digital marketing agency uh, who I believe have been doing some work with uh, the RYA to help clubs improve their digital presence. Hi, Simon. Uh, are you there? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. 
Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a, a, a sort of uh, interesting three years for us, just working closely um, with the RYA, mainly at the conferences, um, talking about a wide range of subjects from everything about good web website design, um, looking at sort of things like Facebook boosted posts and other subjects within social media as well. And um, so I suppose the, the latest leg of the, the journey with the RYA has been working one-to-one um, -to -one with um, saleability clubs, just reviewing what they're doing online, everything from, from websites right through to their social media channels and just coming up with action plans uh, with them, making sure they're making decisions of where they're going to go with the future of digital for their, their clubs. Yeah, great. Well, it's, it's obviously a hot topic, isn't it, um, marketing? And um, I look forward to hearing your views a little later on. So thanks, Simon. So once again, welcome to everybody, uh, our panel, you out there. Let's get the ball rolling with a quick recap on the background to how this all um, triggered off, really, uh, the webinar, that is, and the research that triggered it. Liz, you were at the sharp end of this, uh, this development. Give us a summary of the research and what we learned. Okay, Matt, thanks very much. Um, yeah, covering the topic of marketing and communications in five minutes is a challenge. Um, so I thought what I'd do is, it's such a big topic, is just draw on some of the observations that came out of the futures research uh, as I did it. Um, now, which button am I pressing? I'm using two computers here, guys, so just bear with me. That one? Mm -hmm. Hang on. We're just having a little technology moment. There we go. Thanks, Alistair. Um, so, in the previous webinars, we've talked an awful lot about um, the wide amount of choices that people have and how younger generations are wanting to do multiple different experiences, different activities. And so, over here on the one side, we've got us running our sailing clubs, trying to promote the sport of sailing. And then over on this side, we've got basically everything else that people can go and do. So essentially, there's an enormous amount of competition for people's time and their energy and, of course, their money. Now, part of the research that I, I, was, I was asked to do for British Marine was to benchmark against other activities. And I think what became really evident as I started that exercise is that there's other activities that are really strong on selling the sort of lifestyle and outcome of their sport or their activity. It's the aspirational piece what we want to think of ourselves doing, whether we are in fact actually any good at it or not, is sort of beside the point. It's out there having fun. Um, and as you look around other activities, there's some really interesting things going on. The use of imagery to inspire, um, that setting that scene of where you wish to sort of, you might want to see yourself spending your time and that's probably not in the office. And I think what's really important, certainly for our industry, is seeing that the equipment part of this becomes sort of secondary. The equipment's in the background. It's about what the, what the outcome is. Um, and this one, I think, again, sort of from the biking world, really sort of sets the scene about appealing to your emotions, those dreams you have of, of where and how you might want to get involved in an activity. So the world of sailing has some way to go. Um, and I think it's fair to say that typically, uh, not all the, across the world, but typically we haven't been that great necessarily at promoting our sport when other activities have moved ahead. We tend to look a little bit sort of cold and grey at times. And I think we all have a role from the top end down to the industry, down to people running clubs. Everybody has a role in improving how we sell our activity, our sport. And that's really why we're here tonight. So very quick little piece on sort of some marketing theory. Um, just thinking about the whole subject of when you're trying to get people to come and join your club, it's very similar to whether they're making a decision to buy a car, buy a house, or buy a new piece of IT. Um, there's a, a process they go through, and it sort of maps onto something we call the sales funnel, and there's a kind of buying decision that goes with it. And then at the start of this process is about getting people interested. And that's about them finding out about you and what your invitation is like to come into your club and, and take, understand more about you. And then the next stage will be that piece where they want to come and see a little bit more and maybe have a, a test drive, so to speak, because if you're going to try out a new car, it's what does that feel like? Can they come to an open day? What, what can you offer them to kind of see what it feels like to be a member? And then the final piece, when they've actually joined, is about what is their actual experience and will they stay? And this is really important. And so when you're thinking about 
approach, sort of approaching the subject of marketing and communications, at the top of the scale, the newcomers need a completely different set of information to the people who are your member. And it's really worth thinking about that when you're planning things like newsletters, websites, and so on. So it's a kind of key point. Think about that buying decision route as you're going through. Now, another key thing that really jumped out in the benchmarking exercise was first impressions when you arrive at effectively the front door or the shop window of other sports and other activities. I think as a general rule, I'd say people and happy faces tend to capture hearts and minds. And once again, you notice there's no equipment in this shot. It's about having fun. And there's a general adage that people do buy people first. So shots of equipment aren't necessarily the thing to bring them in. And as a club and a member of an organisation, a really important thing to go and look at is what are your key touch points and first impressions for potential new members? What does that feel like? What does that look like? And everything your organisation does will send a message. And whether that's someone answering the phone or not answering the phone, whether it's what your staff say, what your members say, there's, there's verbal and non-verbal messages going out all the time in all of your communications. I think it's really important to sort of yeah, be understanding what that feels like for a new member. And then there's another question to ask yourselves is, is your shop window helpful for new members? And very typically, I've grabbed an example from a local club to me here because this is quite understandable. The focus of their website, for all the menu buttons here, is very much about existing members. Well, I totally get that, except if you're a newcomer coming along, is it obvious what to do, where to click, and how to get involved? It might sometimes be a little bit buried or a bit of an afterthought. So it's an area to think about. And again, benchmarking with a local organization to me, this is a cycle club, this is their home page. And you're straight into a page that's talking about we're open to all ages, all, all abilities, come and join us, here's how, clicks and links to get involved. And the image there looks like there's a bunch of people there having a lot of fun. There's not a piece of equipment in sight. Um, and it kind of works. And it just says right from the moment you arrive on their website, this is what we're about. So think about um, are you looking approachable for, for new members and how? I think another quick point is joining is a lot more than just about forms and fees. Obviously, that bit's part of the process. But have we explained the why? And it's an opportunity I often see that's missed, not just in sailing and in other uh, sort of sides of my business. But make sure perhaps you've asked someone to be a little bit of a mystery shopper. What does that experience feel like to come and join your organization? Because if you haven't told them why they should join, the be next best thing they want to see is not the price. Probably wants to start with why they should get involved. But it's really lovely to see. And again, I've just drawn on a few local examples just to me in, around my harbor of some clubs who are doing a really good job at, at making a, a sort of good effort at improving what they're doing, how they're approaching their membership, how they're approaching their joining. There's some lovely examples explaining what they do, explaining why, explaining what the offer is, really welcoming and inviting imagery, using blue skies, I think they can't go wrong there, and just saying who you appeal to. So lots to do, lots to think about, and we've got some really interesting case studies, I think, now to, to follow up on. Well, thanks, Liz. I mean, there's some really interesting stuff there, a lot of stuff, and as you say, rattling through it, um, uh, it's hard to squeeze it into that time. But, I mean, just quickly, what, one of the things that comes across very, very clearly from what you say is that there's a lot that people can consider. Mm. Um, but we are, of course, talking to clubs that are run by amateurs. And so I guess for a lot of people, it will be quite daunting to even know where to start. So what, what would, do you have any advice as to where clubs should start from? Yeah, I, I, I totally get that, and um, I think it's a very valid question. Um, a rule of thumb I've always gone by is eat your elephant one bite at a time. Um, so prioritise. And if your priority is, say, driving new members because membership is down, make that the focus of what you're going to do with your communications and your website. If your priority is more about we've got members but they're not active, make that the priority. Try not to do everything all at once because you'll overface yourself. Mm, good advice, I'm sure. Okay, well, Liz, for the moment, thanks very much. Now, little pause here, because throughout the webinar, we're going to be running several online polls uh, to get feedback from you, uh, the clubs and the sailors out there. Alistair and Mark, you're going to be running this, aren't you? Tell us, how, how does this work? 
Yeah, well, much the same as the last um, webinars, Matt. We've got a number of preloaded polls, um, so effectively a question that will come to viewers, into the screen of viewers. Um, if viewers could just answer as soon as possible, we'll be able to relay the results straight back to you. And it's a really useful way um, just for us to gather where the audience is with uh, marketing communications, but also, you know, just generally, it's a, it's a great way um, of us doing some sort of market research as, as we go, really. Um, so we've got our first poll just to, to test. Um, so this one is, um, how does your club communicate with its members? So if everybody could answer that, we'll just relay the results. We'll just give it a couple of minutes and then we'll close and we'll, we'll put up the results. About 50% voted. Interesting. Okay, we'll just eighty seven percent we'll go there. Okay, we're just gonna close that and then we'll share the results. So you should get up. So as you can see, 84% social media group, 5% app, 35% club management software, 96% email, and 33% print. Oh. Mm. Excellent. Good stuff. Thanks for that. Well, um, there'll be more of those as we go through. So let's crack on and now hear from the first of our case studies. We're going to start with Kate Brown from Dartmouth Yacht Club. Kate, thanks once again for taking the time to join us. I guess your club probably in many ways, as we're probably going to hear, is quite typical of many other clubs in that, in that you've been facing a decline in, in membership. Um, but your approach was a very, as I understand it, quite a traditional um, approach to marketing and communications. Tell us how you went about it. Right, yes. Um, welcome to the Dartmouth Yacht Club, everybody. Um, as you can see, we're situated uh, on Dartmouth South Embankment, right next to the very famous Lower Ferry. Um, and I would say that actually, whilst you say we're quite usual, we're not a usual yacht club. We've got no moorings, no outside space. We actually run no races and we pay all our instructors. Um, but we do pride ourselves on our CASC status, that's community community amateur states club uh, sports club if you didn't know what that was so our ethos is to enable everyone in our community to get out onto the river uh, we do have a very fine clubhouse in the middle of the picture there which is open every day and it's run by full-time staff so we're quite a big business um, and if you're ever in Dartmouth do call in and see us uh, drink meal shower all sorts on offer uh, we also provide the RYA dinghy powerboat and shore based courses but we run those for our members only and we do it all just at cost price we've got very active dinghy cruising and canoe groups and despite our lack of racing knowledge or experience together with the Royal Dart Yacht Club and Ditsum Sailing Club we organize the very successful Dartmouth Royal Regatta Sailing Week so um, again if you're a yachty or a dinghy sailor come down for that Right, um, yeah, we were, um, like many clubs, um, six years ago, we had a very dwindling membership. Um, we were all a bit sad, there were only about 400 of us, um, but we realised we needed to do something about it, but what? Uh, we put our heads together and came up with rather a good idea, we thought, to increase membership and activity. Basically, we would find out what people wanted from us and provide it, and then let everybody know it seemed really simple um, about how to find out. We sent a both emailed and paper questionnaire to current members um, asking what else they wanted to see at the club. Uh, we did the same for friends, neighbours, total strangers, anybody we could get our hands on. Uh, and we asked them firstly what they knew about us, what they thought about the club and then what we could provide that would make them want to join us. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, when it came to what people thought we might be like, we heard, well, you're expensive and elitist, you're a yacht club. 
Anyway, um, which were not. <laughs> uh, the number one reply from non-boat owners was, uh, we want an affordable and easy way to get onto the river and also some training, please. Uh, those with boats, uh, some of them obviously wanted to know how to jump our extremely long harbour moorings uh, waiting list, um, but they really wanted opportunities to sail, cruise and basically get out on the river with, with friends and, and other like-minded people. Families in both groups, um, they wanted a way to get on the water together rather than kids doing one thing and parents another. Um, I would have here moved on to a, a montage of all our activities, but our technology has not worked. So um, you're going to have my uh, idea man for a while. Um, we wrote a five year plan. We bought more dinghies, some SUPs. We increase, increased our canoe fleet. We've got everything from sit on tops to sea kayaks and Canadian canoes. And we made all of those, the dinghies and the canoes, available to suitably qualified members free of charge. Uh, we bought a second uh, motorboat, um, which we enab enabled members to use them for personal river outings, again, if they were, uh, obviously, if they were suitably qualified. And we only, again, sort of a very small charge that really doesn't actually cover everything, to be perfectly honest. Uh, we found more instructors and increased our training offer. Uh, we revitalized our cruising group, enlarged our junior program, instigated club dinghy sailing evenings, and uh, applied and got a Sport England grant uh, to buy uh, a new safety boat. Uh, we applied for grants to put a, set up a bursary fund, which enables local disadvantaged youngsters to join the club and take part in all we've got to offer. And finally, we took what was a very brave decision to almost halve our membership fees to make it affordable for just about everybody. 67 single, 95 couple and 104 for a family. We don't have and we have never had a, a joining fee. So then we set about communicating how friendly and welcoming we are and um, what a great place it is to uh, come and join and what, what we can provide for you. We reproduced a printed leaflet, colourful, bright um, and inclusive. And we uh, de members delivered that door to door around the town, which wasn't an easy task in good old hilly Dartmouth. We advertised ourselves and open day push the boat out type events, both in the local press and on local radio. We invited local magazine reporters to take part in some of our activities and interview the Commodore. Um, that might have been a bit of a risk, but it did result, I'm very glad to say, in some really great copy about what a lovely, welcoming and friendly club and active club we are. Word of mouth has been a very useful tool too. Nowadays, most new members are, are saying they joined because their friends told them how great the club was. Of course, we also produced a uh, new friendly mo fr uh, mobile friendly website, the top of which you can see here. You can't actually see there's a big bit below that that says click here to join us because we also um, introduced an, an online um, joining um, system. We encourage use of our two Facebook pages and all our activity groups now communicate via WhatsApp. Um, put a lot of work in by a lot of people, but the response was actually more than we could have ever, ever dreamt of. In 2015-16, which was four years into our plan, despite the price reduction due to the increase in membership, we took more in fees than in the previous year. And that trend has actually continued for the last three years with a 20% increase year on year. We now have 1,150, so that's up from 400. And they can, we can be seen out and about on the river. They're filling the waiting list for our courses and they're cruising the coast and continent. But uh, we haven't rested on our laurels. Uh, we carried out a second leaflet drop because that actually proved very, very useful. You know, people didn't necessarily look at it the first time, but the second time went, oh, we meant to do this last year or the year before. We continued with open day, push the boat out type things. Um, we've taken every opportunity to get ourselves talked about in the press and on radio. 
Currently, we're looking at how best to add the booking of dinghies and motorboats to our already up and running online canoe booking system. Uh, I was asked to share in the briefing notes what we might have done differently. And to be perfectly honest, it, I suppose the only thing I can think of is to have done it all much sooner. Uh, to conclude, I suppose the DYC's communication message is yes, uh, certainly you've got to use or take advantage of all the modern ways of communicating with people and the way that um, people want to communicate, but don't forget the printed and spoken word because they still work well. So I think that's me, is that? Uh... Well, that's fantastic, um, Kate. Um, and certainly our final words, those of us who uh, come from print journalism are delighted to hear you <laughs> say that print and the spoken word is uh, so important. But what a story that is. One of the first things that strikes me actually about it is, I know Dartmouth uh, very well, um, but how many local members do you have? And was the increase people for, that were all from the same, all from the area? Vast, vast majority are local. Um, we do have um, a, a community of varying, um, economic backgrounds, everything from uh, below just managing to just managing to uh, hedge fund members with their second homes or retirees. Uh, but um, vast, vast majority are actual local residents. Um, some are have second homes. We have found actually it's second homers um, when the say the wife and kids or the one partner and kids comes down without the other one at times, um, particularly if it's uh, a female, they like coming into the club um, because it's a friendly and welcoming place to be. Um, it sort of becomes their local, I suppose, <laughs> as well as the place where they make friends and, and take part in all sorts of different ways of getting on the water. So, yes. I'm sorry, I'm waffling, but yes, yeah. huge majority is uh, local. And it sounds, it sounds from what you said, like success bred success, really, and the, the words sort of spread around. But one, the other thing that interests, I mean, there are lots of things that interest me about what you were saying. But going back to the beginning of what you said, I just wonder when you talked about asking. You know, we struck on a great idea. We we decided to go and ask people what they wanted, which seems an obvious thing to do, but we live in a world where we've been constantly asked to fill in surveys and reviews, uh, no matter what we do. Were you surprised at the level of response you got from people who came back to you and said, this is what we want out of a club? Uh, I would say I would be perfectly honest, slightly disappointed by the number of members who actually came back to us and said what else they'd want. Um, I mean, we did get quite a few. Well, it's, it's great. Um, nothing much else. But we very much try to do word of mouth with um, non-members um, because we felt that that got a better impression of uh, and, and a better response. Um, we were asking, you know, friends, neighbours, and um, we did drop some paper questionnaires through doors with people we didn't know. Um, but we were, we sort of stood in the marketplace and asked people um, on market day and things like that. Well, I think that's very interesting, and I'm sure that there's a, um, a good lesson in there in that it's very easy for us all to, in all kinds of walks of life, preach to the converted and talk to people who uh, are already part of our community, but having uh, the nerve to go out there and ask people outside and then act on it. And I think it's a fantastic example of, of how you can turn it around. I mean, nearly three times as many members now as you've had before, all through, uh, well, not all through, but and halving the membership fees as well. I mean, it's a win-win. Now, uh, thank you very much indeed for that, Kate. Um, now, I'm just getting a nod over here. We're going to do a bit of a poll. Are we, Mark? Are we going to have a poll? Yes. Um, I think that leads very well into asking if your club has used questionnaires or other forms of market research to find out more. And it's seeing the example of Dartmouth Yacht Club and how successful that has been combined in with all of those approaches it's it's something we can see has has it been something you've done so please put your answers in now we're just watching the colors come up on the screen and i'm busy trying to read the screen i think <laughs> hopefully the rest of you got your screens rather closer than you <laughs> and i have 
just, just whilst, we're, whilst you're clicking that, just going to ask Liz a quick question about you know the price. I mean, the thing it's staggering, isn't it? Half the price of membership, and you know how much? How are you surprised at that, or is I mean you're a marketing expert? Is this something that you, <laughs> that you were going to tell your tell your clients it's bound to work? Just do it. Another big subject, Matt. <laughs> but um, but I think it is very interesting, and it's a very relevant part of the mix at the moment and especially given that I suppose if you like the research that we were digging into was how younger people are you know with less capital unable to necessarily get on the property ladder I think it's a very important thing that clubs should be thinking about and certainly again I'm aware of a few uh, local to me that are looking at maybe slightly different pricing brackets for those sort of 20 to 30s who've perhaps got young families to help add to the appeal and make it just more one less barrier I suppose mm. so I think it's fascinating to actually see an example where it's worked mm. it's a bold move isn't it but it requires quite a lot of commitment I guess and as we heard it was a four-year four-year project I think it requires confidence but given what Dartmouth have obviously done which is put in all those those nuts and bolts around of what people want it's an incredibly you know good value you why wouldn't you say yes with all the instructors the boats and everything else that they've done it makes it a no-brainer to join Kate here can I just interrupt the one thing I didn't mention is you also got as a member you get 20% off all food and drink in the bar and restaurants <laughs> quite a few of us get our whole all our money back fantastic well I, mean, <laughs> I think you've got quite a few people here who do you want to join as well yeah. <laughs> you're welcome <Right. laughs> Thank you once again for that. Let's just have a Mark just tell us about what's going on with the poll. Well we've got 59% here who've said that yes, they've surveyed their members, but what I find extraordinary is not a single club has surveyed non-members. And we've seen just here, we've seen the success yeah. of taking a look around the local community and asking them what they want. And so if any club out there is saying, hang on, we've got a dwindling membership, yeah. surely the place to look is your local area at the people who are non-members. And here we've seen a perfect example of it working and yet not a single club here has surveyed non-members on our survey. Now that wasn't a ticking off for you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yes it was. Oh, okay, fair enough. It was a ticking off, so give okay, it we've been talk to non-members. Right. Fascinating point, very interesting um, presentation. Right, thank you very much. We must rattle on, time is pressing on. Um, so our second case study is uh, James Wardle, who's here in person, sitting right next to me. James, um, you're from St. Denny's Boat Club, just down the road. You've got a club of a very different kind, haven't you? Tell us a bit about how you've grown your membership. So, hello, thanks for inviting me along. It's uh, good to hear you all today. Uh, so, yes, we're St. Denny's Boat Club. We are perhaps the smallest boat club on the Solent. We are a site which is 30 metres by 10 metres. Uh, we are just by the bridge in Southampton. We have bridges to get under to get to the sea. It's somehow not really a very attractive place for sailing. It's about as far up river as you can go. Uh, but that said, we're incredibly uh, popular this year. It hasn't always been that way. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were really struggling for membership. We had an aging membership, uh, not many families involved. You know, the same classic problem that most of you probably have. People are very time poor. So they need things to go and do. So our club is a little bit unique. Uh, we are the club that comes with boats. So we are a club for people that don't own a boat. And uh, you can join us. We will get you started with some basic training. And you can go out on the water. You can sail. You can row. That's what we started off doing 100 years ago. We've, of course, added paddle boarding and kayaking. So we really try to be a one-stop shop. Uh, but it wasn't always this way. We were very much... Uh, Hidden, I suppose. People didn't know we existed. And uh, we thought, okay, what can we do to make people notice us? So we've taken a very sales based approach. And it's something that Liz mentioned earlier. You kind of want to have a sales funnel. I know sales is kind of a dirty word, but you're trying to sell your membership to the people that are out there. So if you, um, you know, wander on, we've had a really successful year with a small club, as we said. But with our marketing this year, we've got up to 200 adults and 100 children as members. And, uh, you know, we are the club for people that don't own a boat as far up the river as you can go without running out of water. So what did we do to go from slightly struggling to really successful? Uh, we applied Liz's model of a sales funnel to how we get people 
out in the water and involved. So we start off with how do people discover us? We discovered that we were invisible. People didn't know we existed. People were joining us who'd been walking past on the park, you can see on the other side of the river there from us, for five years. And they tell us, we've been walking past for five years, we didn't know you existed. And this is amazing, I should have joined five years ago. So we thought, okay, we've got to do something about this. We then have to engage people. How do people see us? How do we get them connected? And uh, we started off with the discovery. And a lot of the stuff you've heard about from Dartmouth is about paper marketing. It's about online marketing. Um, it's all kind of a little bit scary, isn't it? There's all these different things you can do, all these places you've got to advertise. It looks like lots and lots of work. Um, I think it needn't be. Um, you know, there's the basics to do. Make sure your club is listed on Google, which we did. Go and find the apprentice reporter at your local newspaper who's desperate for stories. Uh, we know the lovely Emily at the Daily Echo in Southampton. We sent her pictures, we sent her stories. She writes about us. It's incredible. Um, we do a lot of really good things at the club. Now, we'd love to be on page one of Google, but if you go and type Sailing Club Southampton into Google, there's an awful lot of us. We're on page four. No one ever finds us. So we've actually gone, well, okay, who do you find when you type Sailing in Southampton into Google? And actually, Eventbrite, the calendar people, come up almost first with all of these big fancy yachting events. So everything we do as the club sits on Eventbrite as a calendar, and it's public so people can find us. And again, we've got other local websites where we put things in. Now, this seems like a lot to do, and uh, particularly with social media, I'm, I'm getting on for 50 now, so I have no idea how social media works. But we've done things like we've <laughs> given our Instagram profile to one of the club members' children, who's 15. Um, I don't really understand Instagram. Every time I look, there's just kittens. But what she <laughs> seems to be doing for us is posting pictures of a seal, pictures of a cormorant, hey, look, there's somebody upside down in a kayak. And it really works. People are following us, they're liking us. I don't understand it, but you know, it gets us traffic, which is a really good thing. So people have discovered us, we're not invisible anymore. So then for us, engagement is all about the website. And our website, of course, like Dartmouth, we've done something that works really well on a mobile phone, really well on a PC. More than half our customers view our website on our mobile phone. And the question we asked ourselves about our website is what do we want people to do when they visit our website? Well, we want them to connect with us somehow. Once someone's seen our website, we've got about two minutes before they go back to looking at the kittens again. So we've got two minutes to capture their intention. So we've really simplified things. We've got pictures on the front page. We've made it something really easy and dynamic to change. We use one of these drag and drop website builders called Weebly. And again, we've given it to someone who's got no technical knowledge at all. They're just quite good at telling stories. And uh, they update things, they write things, they really make it somewhere that people can go. And on every single page, there's a button that says at the bottom of the page, when you scroll down, do you want to join? Or would you like to book a tour of the club? And so that comes on to how we connect with people. And I think connecting is perhaps the thing that we all need to focus on. I think we all do discovery, kind of okay, we've all got a website these days, but do we really connect with people? So with us, uh, you can book a tour of the club. We use a system called 10 to 8, which is like a, an appointment booking system. And you can click, you can choose a time. For us, you can book twice a day, two o'clock in the afternoon, six o'clock in the evening, seven days a week. We don't have people there all the time, but if someone books, we get 24 hours notice. We'll hook them up with a member who will go down there and see them. 10 to 8 is a really brilliant thing. It's free. I have no idea quite how, but you book something. You get an email reminder, you get an SMS reminder. It's reduced our no-show rate from bookings from quite a lot to absolutely none. Everyone turns up. The other really simple idea to connect that we've got is a phone number. Does your club have a phone number? Is the phone in the club? Is there anyone there with the phone? That's usually the way. Yeah. Uh, we've had people who joined up who said, you know, you were the third club we contacted. We thought, you know what, I'll try that other club over the river the first. We rang them up, no answer. Sent them an email four weeks later, no answer. With Skype, we've got a brilliant way of working because if you have your phone number as a Skype number, it looks like a geographic number. So 02380, a proper respectable premises number. But in fact, it goes through to half a dozen different members' mobile phones. So you've got six people who've got a chance of answering that phone call. 
and turning that missed inquiry into a membership. And we do the same on the website as well. We've got a little chat window. You can come and have a chat to us and uh, we'll connect you. So once we've got you hooked in, how do we convert you? Um, I think the most interesting picture here for me is the pile of paper in the middle. Quite often when people come to see us, we still like to give them a paper membership form because they've got something to hold and take away and think about and it tells them about the club. Our membership form, you have to fill in three pieces of information. It's about half a page. Um, again, one of the clubs over the river, they have a 10 page membership form that you need a degree in maths to work out how much you need to pay. So it's all really about reducing friction. And we do that with other things like uh, direct debit payments or you know, automatic emails out to people. Because all of this seems like a lot of work, so we really have to make it as simple and automated as possible. So once we've got you, you're hooked in, you've joined, we've got you out on the water, you're liking it. How do we keep you involved? Well, we get you involved with Facebook groups, we get you involved with WhatsApp groups. WhatsApp is really interesting because a lot of people that object to the idea of being on social media think actually, you know, WhatsApp's okay because it's kind of a messaging service. So that's been really effective. And of course, MailChimp, we send people newsletters, we push them information. So really, you know, St. Denis Boat Club, it's a lovely spot by the sea. Um, you can learn quite a bit from what we've done. None of it's our ideas, it's all ideas we've stolen from people like Simon at Social Bee, from other local clubs. Reduced friction means more members. Advertising is kind of hard, just start with the, the free stuff and answer the phone. It's a really simple thing. If someone sends you an email or calls you, answer the phone, respond to their email. And your members are amazing. Just give them the freedom to market your club and they'll do a really good job. Um, our entire marketing budget is about eight pounds a month. That's all, you can do everything I've mentioned for eight pounds a month. And it's about 30 minutes of effort um, a week, probably to build this. And again, like Liz said earlier, just start with little steps. Don't do everything at once, you know. Do a Google advert one week, a Facebook advert the next. Well, James, there's some fascinating stuff there. Very, very solid advice, sound advice, excellent stuff. Uh, really interesting, particularly, um, I mean, so many things you could pick up on, but particularly when you talk about the cost of it, and that really is a wake-up call. But one of the things that strikes me, um, among many, once again, is you've clearly tapped into some very talented people from a huge range of ages, I guess, by the sounds of it. How did you find the experts within your membership to do this? So I think you don't necessarily need to find an expert. I think you just, I think as sailing clubs, we have a habit of trying to centralize things and say, here's the committee, here's the edict from the committee. We've really found, you know, people have just said, can you go and try and make Facebook work? Can you go and try and make Instagram work? And most of the people that do social media for us I'd say the vast majority are under 18. Um, quite often they do things that upset us ever so slightly, and we can kind of steer them and guide them, but just give people the freedom. Don't be an expert, don't be scared. Um, there's good resources on the RYA stuff, the social bee, and things like that, and just give it a go. So it sounds like you've got a very engaged membership, though, of a membership who want to help. Is that the case, or have you got a pocket of people who are very enthusiastic? And uh, I would say, we, you know, the thing for us is to break things down into tiny little jobs and give things to people. And if you can say to someone, can you spend five minutes of your time in a week just doing some Facebook posts or some Instagram? You know, could you, we've got to do calendars. It will take about half a day at the start of the year to get our calendar on Eventbrite. You can give people little manageable pieces of work and people are, you know, happy with it. They become engaged with it and they're proud of their club. They really feel that they're part of it. You know, it's not there's the committee and there's the members. All of us are about growing the club, making it better. Fascinating. Very good. Um, Mark, I mean, you're, you know a lot about combining media and, um, and particularly the online world. What strikes you about this presentation? The great thing that I can see here at St Denny's Boat Club is distributing the workload so that you're using online tools such as Eventbrite, 10 to 8 and Skype so that it isn't one person's job to always answer the phone. It can go through to whoever is available at the time. And we all have our phone on us all of the time. And so it isn't a case of you have to be in the club to answer the call. You can be wherever you are and, and it can be only if you're available. And I think St Denny's Boat Club is a fantastic example 
of distributing the workload and using online tools to the advantage and exactly as you said connecting with people good great stuff okay right it's time still rattling on i'm going to jump forwards a little bit and uh, we're going to move on now to uh oh, hang on i've even got myself lost in that so yes third club there we go our uh, third club and that's uh bev and uh, Bev Hakeley is from South Staffs Sailing Club, which is very well known on the uh, dinghy racing circuit. Uh, Bev, you've, you've been looking at youth participation, I believe. Tell us a bit about uh, the digital tools and how you've been engaging with the youth. Well, um, it's, it's, we started off with youth, but um, what I'm going to go through in the presentation um, really started off with a, a communication challenge for South Staffs. So we are a club that's in the Midlands that's next to Junction 12 on the M6, probably a relatively small water in comparison to most of the clubs. However, we do have 330 members and we're lucky to have 80 youth and junior members, um, which really sets us up for the future in having such a youth membership. And as I said, one of the biggest challenges for the club is really about how we engaged our current members and how we kept communication at its best. Um, it has evolved a lot since then, um, and I'm going to talk you through how. So, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, it's something that's become very much an everyday part of our club. Um, and as it's already been referenced, it really is around that lifestyle marketing, whether it be the words, the videos we're now posting, or whether it's just the pictures, and really the emotion of much more than just a sailing boat. Twitter, we've got 783 followers. Our public Facebook has over 1,500 engagements each month and has 290 of our members as part of it. We also have a number of class Facebook messenger groups with lots of different social media partnerships in a lot of what we post regarding the sailing club. We also started Instagram new in 2018, uh, but with anybody with kids, it's absolutely the uh, social media platform that we need to make sure that we're definitely part of. And really, with only introducing it in 2018, we've already got 150 followers and 300 posts each month. Now, if I'm honest, social media for the club has become a window into the club. Whether you're my nine-year-old daughter and her friends, or whether or not they're on Instagram and they're sharing their own videos of them sailing together over the weekend, or whether actually you're my dad that's on Facebook that follows that follows what we're up to at the club each week. It really is a vision into our sailing club and it's really, really grown over the last few years. And I think everything else that I talk about has really just supported that. And it's not just one individual member. We also have a lot of Facebook sharing of our own our staff posts that goes into a much wider reach um, of friends of friends, which is where we've had a lot of our new members. But it really is something that's very active. Now, the other one that I want to talk about, um, and this is something that myself and my husband established for the Sailing Club, um, we created a South Staffordshire Sailing Club team app. Now, this has been primarily created for our youth and junior training programme. Um, anybody can download this app from the Apple Store and create a specific version to you. It really is very simple for you to be able to use and then to almost personalise and make it very specific to your own sailing club. It really is relevant and in line with other sports and organisations that many parents with children are really, it, it's, it's very much a, a forum that everybody's used to at the moment, um, whether or not you're in a football group and you need to know when the next football match is and whether um, your son's playing or your daughter's playing in that football match, it's something that is definitely the norm. Whether it's OSM for scouts, clubs or guides, they're just a few examples. But it is very much a platform that is expected, I believe now, from parents with children that move into any sport. So we decided to establish it. If I'm honest, it was a bit of a run. Um, and I think, as, the, as Liz explained earlier, maybe eat your elephant one bit at a time is definitely one thing for the app. Um, because I think... What you can do on the app is activate certain functions at a set time. So you can see from the um, initial team app front page, you've got news, you've got events, you've got chat, you've got gallery. You've then also got, we've put documents on there. So we upload links to um, specific YouTube videos for training. 
Um, we also have now a merch app, but this has really developed over the last two years. It really started as a communication tool for all of our children and our adults. And it's a great tool because children can join on their own as well as adults. It's an event weekly diary. So initially when we started juniors, we did do the old publish, um, a yearly planner of what was happening which, every single week. But as with our junior training, we do it every single Sunday from March until October. And we're really unsure of who's going to attend each week. And that goes from supporters in terms of those people that come and help us with the power boats through to the individuals that come and do the training, the children themselves. So what it allows people to do on the app is be able to see what's happening. And you can see that under the events tab on the right hand side. So for each week, you can see a what we're training, what we're going through, whether it's a special event, whether it's a Star Wars day or a pirate day, or whether actually it's a weekend at the club that we might be away at the coast. Um, and there is an ability to upload everything and a weekly blog. So it also becomes quite a fun social media chat for everybody that's part of that group. We also have done a revenue link, so the merch which I'm going to come on to later links into the app and actually you can purchase merchandise off there. But it really is that overall one-stop shop that's expected now I believe from parents. It is a marketing structure so it is a tool that says you know what I know those five dates throughout the year I really want to go to. But it's also a planning tool for us as leaders of the junior fleet to really understand which parents are going to come and help us out which children are going to come from what fleets and what sailors and instructors are going to be there to support us. So it really does add an element of forward planning that really does support what we do with junior training. And then that kind of ties into what we do across the club around a weekly communication. So each week we have a Good News Friday, which is just a weekly digital newsletter that's emailed out. Um, it's done on MailChimp um, and it's shared also on our private Facebook group. And there are currently 311 subscribers and it's a really great tool of making sure that we keep our current membership engaged. We also have updates on team app following weekly activities, we share photos and chat and then we've also got a social media plan which is coordinated from Buffer which allows you to plan many weeks in advance what you want to send out. You just send one and it goes to all of the social media sites. And it's really amazing alongside the club calendar how many opportunities exist to really engage with our members and we really believe that engagement with our members has been the key goal with all of this and then really what it kind of evolved from what i've got there is a picture of uh, a little bit of marketing that we then decided to put on social media and on, on our relevant relevant um, digital channels and also onto our team app Regarding our push the boat, our try sailing in May, which also coordinated with the RNLI fundraising day, which is much more than just sailing. It very much sells a lifestyle and what would be a fantastic day that any child and parent would want to be part of. Um, and this is something that we are really only just establishing um, in terms of the marketing of such events. But we did put it out for the first time last year and it was one of our most successful, most memorable days of 2018. And on the back of that, we've also updated our website so that it is now designed for tablet and mobile devices. And then, as I mentioned before, we also have a merchandise revenue that goes directly into our junior funds. It's been done by Sailloft, and it's really simple. We, you can individually design what merchandise you want, and then literally they, you order it through their website. So you don't have to worry about organizing any specific sizes, order forms, payment, and it really automatically comes directly to the club. It's a fantastic way of income generation, and it's something that our club's really brought into this year. It was only set up in September last year, and it's already raised nearly 400 pounds for our club. And then really, on the last, kind of this is almost where we're branching into um, and this I have to be honest has been driven by uh, many members in our club but also some of our junior members who may potentially go out in their office with their uh, GoPros do a bit of video in and then want to be on YouTube because that's what the youth need um, but we've also then generated a number of videos uh, whether that be around Star Wars Day, whether that be about what we've done over the year for the club, whether that be a couple of our children out in boats. But really, this is a fantastic tool for marketing. And if I'm honest, some of the stats around YouTube being 70% of children's time, it definitely is something that we need to get more involved in.
Um, so that's just a little bit of a share from South Staff. So I'm not saying that any of that's perfect. And definitely it's been a bit of a let's see how it goes and see where it leads us to. Um, but I have to say the fantastic feedback that we've had from our members clearly means that it has been a great success. Well, it looks great, uh, Beth. That's absolutely fascinating. Yes, another really, really interesting uh, example of how to engage the membership. And um, what a, I mean, a really very thorough approach as well, an online approach. So it's fascinating to see how you pulled it all in, particularly the team app. I never heard of that myself. That's very interesting indeed. I mean, the, the first thing that strikes me is that's a hell of a lot of work as well. And I mean, as I mean, some of us around this table in this room have uh, been driven websites and um, for work, you know, as journalists. And there's a adage that goes around, which is feeding the beast. And whenever I sort of see anything online, it's sort of you think, oh my God, how do you feed it? And looking at what you were doing, how difficult was it to actually? I think really it took 45 it? minutes to set the app up. You just need to put in a few pictures and then add people. And then, yes, probably a number of our members add things onto that team app weekly. Um, and myself and my husband as instructors probably upload um, and plan the events, but it probably takes half an hour a week. It's really not time hungry. And, and how many, just to put it into perspective, how many members of South Staff Scott? We've got 330 members. Okay, so it's a modest, it's a modest sized club. It's not like you've got a massive pool of people to draw on. No, not so. No, and I suppose um, success breeds success, I guess. People see it up there and do they want to be part of it and they start thinking, oh, I can do that. I'll put some stuff up as well. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, in terms of the people that are currently on Team App, that's definitely the case. Um, I think in terms of using it as marketing, in terms of generating more uh, members, that's something that's really not been tested fully. Um, it's definitely been a purely around engagement of our current members. And does it, um, from an age group point of view, I mean, you talked about, um, you mentioned several times in your presentation about uh, the younger members being engaged with YouTube and social media and the rest of it. Has this um, sort of desire, uh, or even, how has it worked through the age group? Is it many of the younger people that are driving it, or is it across the whole club? You mentioned that people like benefiting from it, from being able to see at all ages what was going on, but how many, what age group is contributing? I'll be honest with you, I think I'm a parent, I've got an 11 year old boy, I've got a nine year old girl, but actually as a parent I get an awful lot from that and got an awful lot from it when we used to do the football and they used to have a similar platform and I think that's exactly what we found at South Staff, that the kids love being part of it and they love having their own um, impact on whether it's Instagram, whether it's the team app um, or, or whether it's any of uh, our other channels, but actually the parents get the most out of it. I think if I'm honest, in terms of organising what plan, what happens throughout the year, to be able to see exactly what happens across our junior programme and our club programme, our parents use it as an organisational tool to be able to make sure that it's in the diary so that they can attend. Um, so I wouldn't say that it is just the junior members that benefit it is definitely the parents um, and, and actually the parents of the junior members that know how important those platforms are really have took to it like a duck to water. Mm, it sounds like a perfect situation where you've got uh, tomorrow's generation of sailors who are prepared to put stuff up and, and, and the older generation benefiting. <laughs> yeah, I also just want to mention because I know e-safety is really important um, but the app is a closed group um, and also the Instagram in terms of access and the safety of children, um, it is absolutely considered when we set it up. Great. Well, thanks very much indeed for um, uh, for sharing that with us. Very interesting indeed. Um, Alistair, Mark, have we got questions that we want to go through at the moment, or are we skipping straight forward? Yeah, so we have been... some questions coming. I think, haven't we? Yeah. So. I suppose here's a good one. Uh, what is the value proposition for the clubs featured tonight? What's the call to action to get people to come and visit? So I don't know if James, you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. So obviously, I mean, our, our tagline on our website and everything we do is join the club that comes with boats. So we're trying to remove the friction of not owning a boat. And uh, the other tagline we use is, however you want to get on the water, you're welcome. So though we're primarily a sailing club and a rowing club, if you want to be a kayaker or a paddleboarder or a motorboater, you're welcome as long as you're doing something that's wet. 
<laughs> and I guess from uh, from Dartmouth, from Kate, from your point of view down there, it's uh, come and join a club that has no boats at all. But it's still, it's a, just a different message. Sorry, I, no boats at all? No, because our I missed that, sorry. No, we have boats. I mean, all these boats that the club, our club boats that people use. Or you mean you've got no boat to come and join us, sorry. Yes, yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, if you've got no boat, you can still get out on the water in all sorts of ways. And for nothing more than your, um, after some training, nothing more than your actual membership. And yeah. it's interesting, as I've been sitting here with my calculator working how much it is per week, having seen uh, um, other people mention that. A good way of marketing it, I think. Good. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, Simon. Hopefully Simon's uh, still there. Simon Badman. Hi there. You are Simon. I mean, where do you think clubs are in in the area of communication? I mean, you've now heard from three clubs. You're an expert in this field of of comms and digital comms. What what are your impressions? I, I, I think I'd want to reiterate the point that that uh, Liz made right at the start. It's it's little by little. Um, nudge by nudge and um, what what we found is, is we've been working with clubs over the last three years it's 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 getting that that priority right um, and if it's helpful I, I feel I've got a very very quick list I can go through of some things to consider so so the first one is is, is you know in terms of creating the funnel um, making sure that people can find you now that could be your website could be your website placement on Google but probably of equal importance is something called Google My Business. So when you search for any club, um, you'll have a Google My Business record, even if you don't know you've got one, which Google has nicely created for you. It's the bit on a desktop that appears on the right-hand side, or on your mobile phone, it appears right at the top with a little map. And we were working with a club um, earlier this year, and they, they found out the chairman's home address was listed on the Google My Business rather than where the activity was. Um, so what you do, um, if, you, if you find uh, you have an incorrect record, you probably haven't got access to it. So it will say, own this business. Click on there, follow the steps um, through, and you can get into the, the record. You can put your own photos in there. Um, I've just been looking at some clubs um, randomly, and it's amazing the amount of people that are actually reviewing clubs on Google as well. And people take those, those reviews um, really seriously. Once people have got, got over that barrier and they're looking at your website, um, two things. One, it's been mentioned already. Make sure your website is, is responsive, mobile friendly. One in four people in the UK now do not search or use the web um, via desktop or laptop. They are mobile only. So mobile is, is of increasing importance. The second thing to mention is make sure your website is secure, has um, SSL authentication, so it appears as HTTPS. Um, Google and other browsers are now flagging sites which don't have that as not secure right at the top. Um, for any anyone who's in the know, you're not going to put any personal information, you're not going to put contact details in there, but you're not going to going to sign up for um, any uh, newsletters or, or, or for membership, for example. And then I suppose the, the other the other side is is knowing where where social is going. And very much there there is a tendency um that um less less is more these days so especially on still the biggest platform uh, for social media um out there facebook that a quality post a, a video an image not posting three times a day you'd be pleased to know as a club volunteer and um, not posting three times a day or even three times a week and um, we're seeing more success people creating a quality post um on their facebook page and then using other ways We've been talking about apps tonight. We've been talking, haven't been talking about some um, Facebook groups, but Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups are a great way of getting those regular uh, messages out to your your members. And then the other the other two two quick things, which has been a common theme of the, the training that we've done, where volunteers have said, "Well, we, we we didn't know this. We didn't know this was available." Um, the insights on on most of the platforms we've been talking tonight, the analytics, um, will show you um, who you're connected to. So especially on things like Facebook and Instagram, you can see the, the, the age, the demographics, where they are um, in, in the UK. Who, who am I actually talking to? So you can start shaping your posts um, to that, that audience or thinking, well, actually, we haven't got the audience we're trying to access on this platform. 
and maybe we need to 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 encourage them to come on this platform or maybe use a different platform and then the, the, the last thing i'll mention as well is actually the timing um we, we heard about you know buffer's a great app and um, there's things like hootsuite and others out there as well um facebook you can schedule your posts to go out, and out um in in facebook on a regular basis but the, the key question I always get is, well, yeah, but what time? What what time is best? And in my profession, there's literally hundreds of posts and guidance out there, which which says, you know, these are the best times to post for these different audiences. Um, I'd actually say it's a lot of nonsense. The best time to post is when your audience is online. And you can look at that um, in the analytics uh, within Facebook. So if you go to Insights Posts, um, you can see when your audience is online and schedule it to the, the peak uh, time so you're speaking to the room when it's full. That exists in, all, in Instagram as well. And then within Twitter, um, you have third party tools like um, Follow Wonk and Twiri that you can use to, to analyze that. So, so that's, that's mainly what, what we've been doing is, is, is literally giving those, those nudges and that, that support um, to clubs. And those are just some of the common themes that have been, been coming up um, during the training. And especially with the sellability clubs over the last uh, month or so. Fantastic. Well, yet more solid, sound advice there. I couldn't even write it down quick enough. But um, <laughs> um, yet again, another fascinating approach. And I mean, I, I sort of declare an interest here in some ways in that as my day job is producing TV shows and, and some of that uh, goes online. And, and we have a, a YouTube channel, World Sailing Show channel, shameless plug there. But um, <laughs> one of the things that's driven the audience there is the analytics. And uh, the analytics on YouTube alone, I spend a lot of time looking at that. And apart from making me a bit of a nerd, it's fascinating. And, and what you say, Simon, about knowing your audience and getting a feel for it is, I think, absolutely right. And I think it applies I mean, I do it professionally for, for our show, but I think it applies to anybody who's trying to gain an audience and uh, and keep an audience, basically. And I think the other thing that was interesting that you said was about knowing your audience and the time to play stuff. Couldn't agree more. We have the same thing with the shows. It's knowing when people are available to go and watch it, and uh, you've got to know your own audience. And it's uh, it's 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 sort of basic journalistic stuff in many ways, but uh, it's easy to overlook. Simon, thank you very much indeed for that. I'm very conscious that we have uh, overrun a little bit here. Um, I think um, that was all great stuff. Liz, the work's carrying on. Um, we're going to have to wrap up, aren't yeah. we? So the work carries on. Tell us what's in store from here on. Well, next up, Matt, is going to be a live event, uh, which we're going to do at the Dingy Show. Uh, both days we're putting together a panel which is most of us in this room along with a panel of young people um, bouncing some ideas on them and really the whole purpose of the event is to get their feedback and their insights so that we can all learn from what the next generations are wanting out of sailing and sailing clubs. Great well, that sounds very exciting for those of you who were uh, thinking dinghy show what dinghy show the Dingy Show at uh, Alexandra Palace <laughs> in a few weeks' time. So uh, if you are abroad, it's definitely worth flying over. It's not very far from the airport. It's the best show in the world. Um, Only one of so, its kind. <laughs> so, so come and so it's, oh, it's the second to third of March. Thank you, Mark. I knew it was pretty soon. Um, brilliant. Thanks for that. Now, in the meantime, um, before you hear from us again, uh, because there is actually another webinar after the live one, isn't there? I'm not sure if you yeah, don't yeah, we'll but there will be you. another one. Yep. So uh, we do want to hear from you again. Uh, in the meantime, please do send us um, your thoughts, your feedback, so your money if you like, um, to the email that's uh, on the bottom of the screen. I think it'll be on the screen at some point anyway. Um, we're also going to make a link to, we've been recording this webinar as always, we're going to make that link available uh, so you can view it afterwards, which I think would be very useful because there's been such good, such a lot of good information in this web webinar. And of course it's available to those who weren't able to see it. So those of you who uh, joined us this evening or during this session uh, and you want to pass it on, um, other people can uh, go and have a look at it. So that's about it really. Uh, finally, Thanks very much to our guests, uh, Kate Brown, James Warden, uh, Beth Haightley, uh, and of course, Simon Badman. Thanks to our panel, as always, Alistair Dixon, Liz Russell, Mark Jardine, 
And of course, thanks very much to you. I do apologise for making this a bit late, and I hope that you haven't either burnt your dinner, missed your lunch, or missed your bus to go to work. I hope that hasn't been the case. But thanks very much for joining us indeed. We look forward to seeing you again next time.